my topic is narcissism and, and I understand you're kind of one of the, the world's experts. So um, the first thing I'd just like to talk about is yourself. And if you could just give me kind of your story um, and how you came to be uh, an expert in narcissism. Well, in a nutshell, because I'm, I would like the interview to focus on my, on my work in the field rather than my personal history. Yeah. In, yeah. In, a nutshell, in a nutshell, I had been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. And um, then I discovered that there's a dearth, there's almost nothing, no literature, no understanding of the right. disorder. Um, the disorder had just been introduced into the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, so no one knew what the heck they were talking about. And so mm. I, had to, I had to do my own research. I had to invent a whole new language, which is currently in use all over the world. So most of the phrases you hear when you talk about narcissism, I had to coin them in 1995. And I had to do that because there was no language to communicate the vagaries and the exigencies and the vicissitudes and the nuances of narcissism, its effect on the narcissist, and its impact on people around the narcissist. So that's in a nutshell. Right. And then I wrote a book, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I, I placed, I created the first website on narcissism. And for 10 years, it was the only website. Mm. And I created the first six support groups for victims of narcissistic abuse, which is a phrase that I had coined, narcissistic abuse, as well. Wow. Yeah, so I think let's talk a little bit about um, kind of those, the, the, the language you were speaking about. So can you kind of help me define narcissism? And maybe we can also talk a little bit about how we currently now go about diagnosing it. There are two types of narcissism. There's healthy narcissism, which underlies self-esteem, self-confidence, a sense of self-worth knowing your limitations, establishing boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. You need narcissism for all this. And that's healthy narcissism. And then there's the malignant version, the pathological version of narcissism, where there's a narcissistic style which can sometimes evolve into a narcissistic disorder. And the narcissistic disorder involves basically, basically two things. The first one, is an inability to relate to other people as autonomous or independent entities, an internalization of other people, treating other people as internal objects. That's the mm -hmm. first major thing. And this, of course, precludes the ability to exercise empathy, the ability to commiserate with people, to be compassionate, to help people, um, to defer to people, to compromise with people. So this this inability to regard other, other people as external to you as a narcissist renders the narcissist a social misfit. And in this sense, narcissism is a bit, a bit akin to autistic spectrum disorders. I see. That's one, one element in narcissism. And the second element in narcissism is a cognitive distortion, a misreading of reality and the world, um, an impairment of what we call reality testing which is known as grandiosity. Grandiosity is a mm. filter um, which involves a fantasy defense and a rewriting or reframing of one's personal history on the fly so as to aggrandize oneself mm. and to render one's, oneself unique. Put these two together and you get other types of behaviors. You put these two together, you get, for example, entitlement because if you're the greatest of them all, you're entitled to special treatment. Put right. these two, put these two together, together and you get envy because other people are, are inferior to you. And if they, if they have accomplishments or if they stand out, something's wrong. So you're envious of them. There's, <laughs> this creates passive aggression sometimes or outright aggression, et cetera, et cetera. We can actually derive the vast majority of narcissistic behaviors or misbehaviors from these two single singular principles. Hmm. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things people kind of throw about um, when it comes to narcissism is they suggest that a narcissist has like no feelings. <laughs> um, but it sounds like that um, 
isn't exactly true when you described it that way. So maybe you can describe to me kind of what it would be like to be kind of in the mind of a narcissist, like how they feel going through their day. There's a, an initial caveat is that there is a an inordinate avalanche and tsunami of nonsense online yeah. about narcissism. Perhaps this is the topic most nonsensitized <laughs> than all other topics. So we have self-styled mm. experts with and without academic degrees spewing total rubbish and trash and um, ah. con conditioning victims to kind of remain in their victimhood and, and pay them as they go along. So it, it has become a cottage industry of a cottage industry which, which comes uh, strikingly co uh, close to con artistry. So one of the mm. more nonsensical claims, for example, is that narcissists are incapable of emoting, capable of emotions, um, another nonsensical claim is that narcissists always claim to be the best, the greatest, and so on. That's another nonsensical claim. Um, and there are many others. Referring more specifically to your questions, narcissists are able to experience emotions, but it is true that narcissists are able to experience only negative emotions. Mm. We, call, we call this range or spectrum of emotions negative affectivity. So narcissists are able to experience, for example, anger, which transforms very fast into rage, known as narcissistic rage. Narcissists definitely are able to experience envy, because envy is one of the defining criteria of narcissistic personality disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So but envy is an emotion, mind you. Narcissists are, are able to experience the whole panoply of negative emotions. They have difficulty accessing and therefore experiencing positive emotions. They had suppressed their positive emotions as children usually. And they had done that because positive emotions were not rewarded in childhood. Whenever the child had experienced positive emotions, he was hurt, he was punished. Um, so the child learned to had learned to associate positive emotions with negative outcomes such as being in pain. So narcissists, for example, very frequently associate love with pain or love with hurt. Mm -hmm. They are hypervigilant. They scan the environment for looming threats. They, are, they have abandonment anxiety, exactly like borderlines. They are terrified of being abandoned and, and consequently of disintegrating a process known as mortification or narcissistic mortification. So, Consequently, narcissists so-called prefer, if you wish, to not experience positive emotions. They repress them. They deny them. We call this process emotional numbing. But the emotions are there. The emotions are there. They are active. They generate energy. This energy manifests in day-to-day -day life and in, in uh, decisions and choices that the narcissist makes. It's just that the narcissist and the psychopath, for example, would tend to deny the existence of these emotions. They would even brag that they are emotionless. Narcissists and, and especially psychopaths, they, they, they create an ideology, an ideological shell around their lack of emotions, around their ruthlessness and callousness and so on. So they, ide they ideologize it. They make ideologies out of it. And, right. and so this could, this could easily slide over or slip over into, into sex. So we have a whole category of narcissists, cerebral narcissists, who are essentially rendered asexual by their own disorder. And they tend to glamorize and idealize and ideologize their, sec their sexlessness or their celibacy or, they, or their asexuality. They, they claim that this renders them superior to other people who are basically bestial and animalistic. So that's an example of how a, a, an agglomeration of emotions known as sexuality or psychosexuality is repressed by the narcissist. And then the whole thing is glamorized. Like, yeah, you know, it renders me superhuman, superman. Hmm. So you mentioned um, that some of these tendencies may develop kind of in childhood. I'm curious is have we come 
come to a point yet where we've discovered whether narcissism is kind of nature, nurture, or some combination of the two. There is a general deplorable tendency in psychology to pretend to be a science. And so psychologists team up with neuroscientists mm -hmm. and they come up with the most inane concoctions and, and conjunctions and speculations. The, the facts are these, as far as psychopathy is concerned, we have good grounds to believe that it involves brain abnormalities, potentially hereditary. The same for borderline. There is a strong link between borderline personality disorder and some brain abnormalities, both in functionality and in structure. However, we failed miserably to find any connection, any rigorous connection, mind you, because there's a lot of nonsense online, including nonsense propagated by neuroscientists who think that all of psychology should be abolished because it's all the brain. Yeah? So this nonsense aside, um, we failed to find a rigorous connection between brain abnormalities, whether structural or functional, and the um, spectrum of behaviors and traits, which together are known as pathological narcissism. As opposed to psychopathy, which involves two or three or four very well-defined behaviors and traits, and nothing else besides, and as opposed to borderline, which involves essentially emotional dysregulation as 90% of the disorder. So in borderline and in psychopathy, we have clear cut clinical features. And therefore, therefore, we are able to come up with clear cut clinical entities similar to bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Or para, you know. So this is not the case in narcissism. Narcissism is such a wide, such a wide array of behaviors and traits that there is no way to reduce it probably to genes, genetics, or to brain functionality or structure. It's too wide. Gotcha. It's actually, I would say, an alternative personality. So if we have a, a healthy, normal personality, the antithesis or this, this, the antonym would be narcissistic personality. So it's a whole, a total personality. Mm -hmm. So you said like not too many years ago, you had discovered there was very little out there for a narcissist. Um, I'm kind of curious now, maybe 10 years later, um, what is available for a narcissist who wants some treatment, um, diagnosis, um, where can they go and, and what can they, they do? I started my work in 1995, which is not 10 years ago, but 25 years ago. <laughs> and, gotcha. and prior to 1995, there have been studies by Sigmund Freud, who coined the, the word narcissism. There have been studies by several other scholars, all of which had belonged to the psychoanalytic, object relations, and psychodynamic schools, a very well-defined group of schools in psychology. And so these people... Uh, like Kohut and Kernberg and, and many others, Winnicott, others, they defined and redefined uh, psychology in terms of ego, in terms of self, in terms of all kinds of structures that they, they kind of came up with metaphorically to describe the functioning of the human mind. This unfortunately limited our understanding of psychology. It was counterproductive, or of narcissism. It was counterproductive, very counterproductive. Now, in 1974, 1974 was the last year anyone had made any meaningful contribution to the study of narcissism. And then there was a 25 year or 21 year hiatus. I mean, there was nothing for 20 something years. And then in the last 25 years, there's been a revival. And today, narcissism is definitely the hot button topic. Mm. In the series, in the television series, In Treatment, which is a television series. Uh, predicated and premised on the work of a psychotherapist. I think um, Gabriel Byrne or David Byrne, I, I don't remember, there's an, uh, the actor there, um, yeah. he, he keeps mentioning, he keeps mentioning all kinds of mental health problems. And he doesn't mention them by name. If you look, if you peruse the series closely, you will discover to your shock 
that no mental health disorder is mentioned by name, with one mm. exception, narcissistic personality disorder. It's the only mental health disorder over two seasons mentioned by name nine times. So it's definitely the hot button topic, right? Yeah. However, the bulk of the efforts goes into treating and helping the victims of narcissistic abuse, the survivors, those who had endured the narcissist onslaught on their identity mm. and their functioning. There is precious little, if anything, intended to help the narcissist. And the reason is very simple. Narcissists are considered untreatable. The disorder is considered intractable. The best you can hope for is to modify certain abrasive and antisocial behaviors of the narcissist, but never ever touch the core. So it's very dispiriting. Uh, it's very you know, disappointing for the, the therapist. Mm -hmm. Therapists don't want that. So they, they reject narcissism. Narcissists, they, they as clients, they, they refuse to work with them. And so a few years ago, trying honestly to help myself mainly, I cobbled cobbled together a new treatment modality, which I dabbed cold therapy. Cold, like very cold, opposite of hot. <laughs> cold therapy. It's an, an amalgam, amalgam of techniques and procedures borrowed from trauma therapies and from child psychology, plus 25 techniques that I had in, came up with. And so this, it, I've spent the last 10 years or nine years to be precise, I spent the last nine years applying this therapy to people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. And the results seem to be good or even impressively good, but the sample is very small. We're talking about 60, 60 patients, 60 clients. Yeah. So we don't, I don't know yet. I can't tell you yet if, it's, if, if this thing works. But it's the first therapy aimed squarely at narcissistic personality disorder. And it, what I, what I, why, why cold therapy may be more effective is because I do not regard narcissistic personality disorder as a personality disorder. I regard it as a post-traumatic condition. The child had been traumatized. The child had yeah. reacted with narcissism. So it's a post-traumatic condition. And the narcissist is a two-year-old child. He never grows up. He never matures. It's unwise to try to apply adult therapies, adult treatment modalities to narcissists. So that's why cold therapy is based on child psychology, actually. I treat the narcissist as though, as though he were a child. So this is the only therapy I'm aware of that yeah. has any impact whatsoever on any important element of narcissism. All the others modify behaviors successfully sometimes, but only, mm. only behavior modification. Well, I'm glad somebody's out there doing the work. Um, so maybe to kind of cap off our interview, let's talk a little bit about the internet nonsense that you brought up earlier. Uh, as you very well know, the term narcissist is thrown around very freely nowadays. You know, you see people on the internet just calling anyone they don't like a narcissist. And um, I'm kind of curious what you think that means for society, the way we treat narcissism, and just the way we talk about mental health as well. If you devalue the term, which is supposedly supposed to denote a clinical entity, if you devalue it, you misuse it, you mis misapply it. The minute you, the minute you corrupt language itself by rendering a clinical entity a way to put down people, a pejor pejorative, a, 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 a curse word, the minute you do this, you lose all the intricate and nuanced understanding of the disorder, and you, you give up on any ability to help yourself as a victim or narcissist if you're so inclined. So the corruption of the language, and there had been a debasement and spoilage and corruption of the language. The word is abused and misused egregiously. It has nothing to do with narcissism as we know it in psychology. So, and, and that the minute you, you do this, 
you're lost. You're lost because you begin to you begin to use the word narcissist, narcissist to describe, for example, psychopaths. You begin to use the word narcissist when you dislike someone. You begin to use the word narcissist to put down someone or to humiliate someone. So it becomes a sadistic tool. You, so today I would say the understanding of narcissism, pathological narcissism, is in much worse shape than 20 years ago. Not much better shape, but much, much worse shape. I watch yeah. they I, I make it a point to watch daily five or six videos from various YouTubers and self-styled experts and so on and so forth. It's an abomination, absolute abomination. Even people mm. with academic degrees who claim to be experts on narcissism, they mislead. Mm. They they talk utter unmitigated rubbish. It's it's horrible what's happening out there. And of course, clinicians, professors of psychology like myself, others, you know, we don't want to dirty our hands. We don't want to go into a mud, into the mud, you know, and fight it out with this. So the, the huge community of victims, wannabe victims, professional victims, real victims, narcissists posing as victims, and so on and so forth, and the community of narcissists. They, they can't get, get the help they want and deserve. There's nobody there almost, with one or two exceptions. There's simply nobody there. And I, I think uh, there's a primary sin of academe. The fact that most academics and most scholars don't want to dirty their hands. They don't want to open their own YouTube channels and try to counter this tsunami of, of you know, misleading information. Um, that's, that is something that is not to the credit of, of academic institutions and, and so on. I'm a professor of psychology and I'm out there fighting the fight. Yeah. I'm creating videos which are based on scholarly research and I'm trying, doing my best, but I'm not nearly as popular as these, you know, um, gurus and so on who kind of pollute and contaminate the arena with with their output yeah well i'm glad you're out there um this is really interesting so i think less i'm all good if there's anything else you'd like to add um feel free but this has been a, a really helpful conversation for my understanding well i think narcissism is no longer merely a clinical entity narcissism is an organizing an explanatory principle of our lives of our environment and of the world at large. Mm -hmm. Using narcissism alone, you could explain maybe 90% of, of what's happening in the world today. You could explain politics, you can explain show business, you could explain the media, mass media, you can explain the alternative media, you can explain, I mean, you name it. Narcissism is sufficient, sufficient in itself without any other type of input, without any other type of principle sufficient in itself to explain so much of our world today. Our civilization had become very narcissistic and is gradually, gradually migrating to psychopathy. Consequently, people, individuals are becoming more and more narcissistic and psychopathic. And that is, that is a gender-free observation. Women are also becoming more narcissistic and psychopathic. And when you look at when you look at politics or business or finance or high tech, no area of life, no field of life, on the individual level and the societal level, is free of narcissism. And not only narcissism as a way to understand things, but narcissism is a way to put things together and organize them. So, job interview, job job interviews in the financial industry emphasize narcissistic traits and behaviors. When you go, when you try to, when you try to apply to a high-tech job, you get the same. When you try to understand your relationship with your girlfriend, you're well advised to take narcissism into account. When you try to, when you try to make sense of politics, of this pandemic, of everything, everything around you, of things, of Netflix, of of television series, of movies, of if you bear narcissism in mind, you are well equipped 
to make total sense of everything that's happening to you and around you. And that is a sad testament to where we're heading because narcissism on the individual level and on the collective level has only one end, ends only in one way, utter, total and unmitigated self-destruction. Narcissists are self-destructive and self-defeating. That is a main feature of narcissism. So you elect narcissistic leaders, you behave narcissistically, your workplace demands that you act as a narcissist, your, uh, your loved ones become more and more narcissistic and you have to adapt. All this leads to a major conflagration, to an Armageddon, Armageddon not in the religious sense, but in the socio-cultural sense. Narcissism ends badly. There is no way for narcissism to end well. There's a group of scholars who are trying to propagate and promote the idea of high functioning productive narcissists. This is pure trash. All pathological narcissism ends really badly. And if you don't believe me, have a look at Donald Trump. <laughs> Yeah. Well, all the more reason why um, I guess we really do need to um, have society come to a genuine uh, understanding of narcissism and kind of move us, you know, part the sea of, of the internet nonsense. Um, now we're currently talking about it. So I'm especially worried with regards to narcissism impact on technology, accessible technology, pop popular technology. And I'm very yeah. worried, I'm very worried. I'm actually most worried about narcissism's impact on intergender relations. This really, really, really bothers me. I'm, I'm losing sleep over this because the very existence of the species is premised and, and built upon intergender tensions, intergender interplay, intergender magic, intergender attraction, intergender collaboration and so on. And when I say intergender, I'm not saying, I'm not relating, I'm not referring to sex. I'm referring to gender roles, which are essentially socio-culturally determined. So you could have same sex couple where there are gender roles, but when gender roles are abolished because of narcissism, it's a direct outcome of narcissism, then we're in serious trouble. We're in serious trouble. And this perhaps is a topic for another conversation one day because you are a men's magazine, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, that is an interesting topic and, and probably one for an, a different article all altogether. Um, but yeah, uh, once again, really interesting. I appreciate you hopping on this call. Sure. Thank and, you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, I'll be in over the next couple of days how the article goes and, and I'll definitely talk with my editors as well. Sure thing. If I upload it to my YouTube, it will give added exposure to mail because my YouTube is pretty, yeah. pretty sizable. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be happy I'm sure that. they'll be, they'll be, yeah, I'm sure they'll be more than happy. Um, all right, great. well, I'll shoot you an email in short time and uh, we'll talk soon. Kind of you, thank you. Have a nice day there. Have a good one. Bye. Bye, take care.